I know that museums can change lives and make people make people happier, make communities happier, and I don't think we celebrate that enough on the Isle of Man. It's such a beautiful place to live. Your heritage, your culture, your, your island can make you happier if you embrace it. When was the last time you explored the Isle of Man's history and heritage? Over the next two weeks, we'll be looking a little closer at just some of what the island has to offer and the practice of preserving it for the Manx nation. From the physical landscape to the stories behind the collections in the archives and on display in the island's heritage sites and the sites themselves. As well as the museum in Douglas, the Manx Museum and National Trust is the custodian of many of the island's ancient monuments which are in public ownership. Manx National Heritage, as it's known, preserves and manages a range of sites situated throughout the island, but its activities have broadened out over recent years. So how was the organisation governed, and just what does it do these days? Edmund Southworth is Director of Manx National Heritage. Sometimes it's easy to say, what don't we do? Because we are a very wide-ranging organisation, and we are a hybrid, we're a, a government-funded body, staff are public servants, but we are simultaneously a registered charity. We are the National Trust for the island, and we bring together a wide variety of roles from librarians, to the keepers of ancient monuments, to museum curators, and those are our statutory roles, but to underpin those we're shopkeepers, farmers, exhibition managers, wedding planners, and so on. How does the structure of Manx National Heritage work? It's unique on the island in that we are instituted, I suppose the best way, we were, we were set up through Act of Tinwald. We are a statutory body, we have statutory functions in terms of ancient monuments and export licensing and and things like that. We are not responsible directly through a minister or a government department. We are governed by a board of trustees and, and that gives us what's called arm's length status. So that we are supported by, by government, we report to Tinwald, the trustees are appointed by Tinwald, so we are accountable and that's hugely important. But we have an element of flexibility to do some of the things as a charity that it might be more difficult for some government departments to do. I think it's very important that trustees are accountable to the will of Tinwald, but also to the will of the community, and that they provide an, an element of scrutiny to make sure that we are providing value for money for our services. Director of Manx National Heritage, Edmund Southworth. One of the most exposed heritage sites in the island is the National Folk Museum at Craig Niche. Helen Ashcroft is Heritage Site Manager for the South. Sometimes I think we sort of disperse the weather for the rest of the island because yeah, it hits us first and hardest, I think. Now, what's the background to Craigniche? What era does it depict? The current design of the museum was based in 1910, but we are moving a bit away from that model. We're in the process of reinterpreting the village and how we present it and we're not going to be so stuck to one era as we go forward and we're looking at how we do farming and things like that as well. Now you do have quite a few special events here you've got May Day and Hopchenay and a lot of the calendar customs it sort of ties in with the seasons and the harvest and things like that and we've got a really good outdoor space and so we can host some really nice wholesome outdoor events. Hopchenay of course being our sort of headline event I think for the organisation it's one of the largest scale events and it's always been very popular and we managed to attract quite a lot of people here. Um, this year is going to be a particularly special one because it's the 300th anniversary since the Ginny the Witch trials. And so we've put some special events on surrounding that for Hop Tune this year. It's a very appropriate place to represent the folklore of the Isle of Man and obviously we've got a lot of history in that and a lot of superstitions, myths, herbal charms and cures and rituals and those sort of things. Those are stories that we can tell very appropriately in a place like Craigneesh. m &H's business to preserve things, to keep them for the nation, but how do you marry that in a place like this with 
the modernization you might need to provide visitors with the kind of things they'd expect at a modern attraction, a modern day attraction? It's really, really difficult. In a, well, in fact, in all historical buildings, it's hard to you know, you know comply with modern health and safety standards and to things like accessibility. And we try and put innovations like that in as sensitively as, you, as we can. So, for example, we recently opened, well, within the last few years, Quirks Craft, which has got an accessible toilet with baby changing and wheelchair access and everything. What we've done there is from the outside try to keep it as authentic looking as it as it can be from the roadside and then of course you've got landscape paths for wheelchair access around the back where you where it's not so obvious In, inside the building it's you know much different to what you would expect but things like our shop is really small because cottages are by nature very small buildings and so we would love to have a larger shop and maybe a larger cafe and so but it's always a little bit of a compromise but we work it out as we go along and make the facilities as functional as we can within the limitations of the properties that we own here. What kind of feedback do you get from people when they come and see the village? I mean, do you get the chance to talk to people about what they, they make of it all? Yeah, well, there's always TripAdvisor as well these days and uh, our public keep us up to date with what their thoughts are about any of our sites through TripAdvisor. But we also have a visitor survey that we ask for feedback from. On the whole, all of our sites feature very, very highly in terms of um, visitor feedback. So um, we score consistently highly in terms of visitor feedback and people do enjoy places like Craignish. They love to see the Manx cats. That's always strongly mentioned and they also a lot of our visitors enjoy sort of stepping back in time and reminiscing and remembering how their grannies or something like that lived similar and like drawing parallels between their relatives and what we're presenting here. We're in Harry Kelly's cottage this is essentially the feature piece of the museum it's what started it all off there's a lot of stuff in here is this the way it would have been? Uh, more or less, yeah. When the museum took over at Harry Kelly's Cottage, they made a couple of modifications which were actually scaling it back. So they lifted the concrete floor that was here in the Thai Moor, which is the kitchen, and you can see evidence of that under the dresser there. There's about an inch of concrete that's still in place there to stop the bottom of the dresser rotting, and they revealed this paddled earth floor below which is very, very durable. And there also was a range in the fire there in the Cholog and that was taken out. And as you can see, we've got an open fire just to represent a little bit before, you know, strip back some of those innovations. Over the winter, we have to make sure that we protect all the all the objects that are in here. We tidied them away and store them in a way that a lot of them remain in the building, but we store them in a way so that they become protected from the damp. And then we routinely go in and light a fire to get a bit of warmth through the place and also provide a bit of ventilation so that it doesn't get too damp. So it is sort of a year-round project, if you like. Yeah, there's somebody coming in this property, through, you know, even when we're closed, there's someone in here once a week to check it over and, as I say, light the fire. Heritage Site Manager for the South, Helen Ashcroft. But with a diverse collection of sites, ranging from 19th century thatched cottages to a medieval castle, how is the programme of work to maintain and preserve the structures prioritised? And what approach is taken to that work? Edmund Southworth again. If I use the analogy of um, a shipyard, in the past uh, we've done major projects, the equivalent of launching a big ship. So Castle Russian was converted to a major visitor attraction. The Laxey Wheel was taken over from the government, refurbished and delivered as an, as an attraction. And then there's House of Mananan, The Sound, Niabel, Russian Abbey, all major new projects completed in the last 25, 30 years. The challenge now is maintaining them all. If I just say that somewhere like Peel Castle, Peel Castle is a ruin. Yes, it's a ruin but we maintain the walls. We do pointing of the masonry on the walls, and we do that about every 25 years. The Laxey wheel we repainted a couple of years ago, refurbished at a cost of a quarter million pounds. And in seven or eight years, we'll do it again, because it's continuously underwater, the paint you know, wears out. So we vary from the really prosaic, you know, keeping the electrics, going, maintaining the lifts, you know, replacing audiovisuals that are obsolete and out of date, from the really hardcore business of making sure a castle roof does not leak. 
it's diverse, it's a real challenge. And of course, we also have something like 3,000 acres of land. So boring things like fencing, making sure the walls don't fall down, making sure the sheep don't fall off the edge of the cliff. Those are all the things that we have, we have to do as well. So we prioritise according, obviously safety comes first. If there's, if there's anything to do with, with safety, that's an immediate priority, it gets done no matter what. But as I said, we start with top level, you know, does the roof leak? There's no point repainting something if we haven't fixed the guttering. And it's based on significance. Some buildings are more important than others. And clearly, there are some things we look at and say, oh, that'll last another couple of years. Clearly, things haven't got to look neglected. And yeah, that's the dilemma. In an ideal world, we'd be throwing money at some of these sites. And as soon as a bit of paint needed touching up, we do the entire thing. Actually, that might be a waste of money. That's sometimes a balance. You know, what's the most cost-effective solution? When it comes to funding, how is the organisation funded? We know there's, there's a, an element of, of government support there, a gov- government grant, if you like, but presumably that's not all the income that it costs to run Max National Heritage as a body. The total turnover of the organisation is, is, is about £5.2 million, and that includes some of the interest we're paying back on loans for the capital spending. So, we're, you know, obviously we're still paying for the house of Mananan, which was built 20 years ago. You know, it's basically we're paying back the mortgage interest. That's how government finances work. But in terms of the revenue support, we get over three million a year from the government. But we generate a further million, nearly a million, in our own trading activity, whether that's admission charges, rents from buildings, corporate hires, the things we sell in the shop, and so on. That is money which is hard-earned, and the team are you know, very focused on making sure that, whilst we are supported by the taxpayer, not a penny goes to waste. We're as efficient as we think we can possibly be. And the organisation is also supported by a large group of volunteers, the Friends of Manx National Heritage. As Community Outreach and Learning Support Officer Katie King explains. Our public programming is often at the weekends, often in the evenings, because obviously that's when our visitors want to to join us. So we do need extra volunteers. So um, Nicola Pemberton, who looks after the Friends organisation, we will approach her and we'll say, look, we've got Heritage Open Days coming up. We need seven different people for this event, or we need... We always need about 30 people for our Hopchune Festival in October. So she contacts her, I think we've got about 6,000 members now, 6,000 friends. So she puts out a sort of mail shot saying, is anyone keen to volunteer? And that's how we we gather people that way. So they're really useful from that perspective. But they're also really um, important to us in terms of collecting as well. So if we want to purchase something for the collection, so something particularly special comes up it's through our friends organization and also through our own charitable funds that we're able to to purchase items for the collection they're vital actually from a a volunteering perspective and also for a helping us keep going perspective and also they are our champions so they're you know they're the ones going around telling people how brilliant we are and they come to all our events they come to all our activities and it's it's through the friends that we have those sort of champions on the street as it were telling people about how 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 interesting and how exciting we are if only you go through the door and you know they're telling their grandchildren that and their grandchildren are telling their friends and so um our friends are what gets us known out there i suppose community outreach and learning support officer katie king as well as its permanent displays manx national heritage also utilizes temporary galleries which showcase a variety of exhibitions throughout the year many of the exhibitions are of contemporary art but the temporary galleries are also used for displays depicting aspects of social history in the Isle of Man, be it events, people or places. Curator of social history Matthew Richardson has been involved in some of the largest temporary exhibitions to be staged by Manx National Heritage in recent years. So what goes into putting an exhibition together? But before that, just what constitutes social history? The Manx Museum boldly defines social history as things that are not archaeology and not natural history. So it's everything else that falls between those stools. From my point of view, personally, I see social history as the history of people. And the, the social history collection here at the museum documents the history of the people of the Isle of Man. These objects document every facet of the human condition. How do you piece together social history? It's very difficult to define because one of the interesting things about working here is you never know 
what's going to turn up next. You never know what someone's going to come through the door with. And the benchmark that we apply to, say, a new object coming into the collections is what does it tell us about some aspect of some individual's life in the past? So there has to be what we call evidential value in that object, and it has to carry some information that's of value to us that may not necessarily be represented visually in a photograph or in another a written source or whatever. Because it's not necessarily how old something is. Age alone isn't enough to make something particularly interesting. I mean, if you look at these Roman vases that they pull out of the River Thames, they're all very old. They're all about a thousand years old, but they're very, very common. There are a lot of them. So although they're old, that doesn't necessarily imbue them with significance. And it's the historical significance that's the key thing. And that's quite an amorphous thing to pin down. And it's often also quite subjective. So what one person thinks might not be the same as another person. So, and, and also the provenance of an object. Very often an object on its own doesn't convey the same degree of significance as when you've got all the provenance that comes with it. So when an object does come into the museum, we're very keen to find out from the person who's brought it in what more they can tell us about it. And if we know who used that object, where it was used, when it was used, any other interesting aspects of its story, you know, that really helps to fill in and flesh out the significance of that object. So it's a bit like a giant jigsaw puzzle then? Absolutely. It's a jigsaw puzzle without a box lid. So you never know how many pieces you're going to get or, or what all the pieces might look like. Now you've curated some of the, some of the major exhibitions that have been here at the Manx Museum yes. over, the, over the last... Yeah, well, 16 good few years. years. 16 years now, yeah. Yes. Where do you start with an exhibition like that? I mean, they, they must be massive projects to put together. They are a huge project. Um, and a big exhibition, you can be talking 18 months of planning, you know, coming leading up to the opening day. Because an exhibition is a narrative, an exhibition is a story, and you've got to decide what the story is that you want to tell. In some cases, it's a completely new story that we might not have presented before. In other cases, it's a slightly different angle, a new angle on an old story. Once you get into the planning of the exhibition, then it's down to the individual curator or curators to work out how they're going to use all these materials that they've got at their disposal to present a coherent story and you want to give those objects the chance to speak present themselves you know you want to uh, allow them to be exhibited at their best so you have to give thought to how you're going to present these these objects so if you have a particularly significant object you might not want it to be buried in a big case full of other things where its significance is going to be lost presenting it on its own in an individual case, maybe just as soon as you walk into the exhibition, gives that object a lot more prominence. So you're saying, look at this, this is important. This is what you should be looking at first. So all of those sort of things have to be weighed up in your mind and gone through. There's a process of editing if you're using text. Text on a wall is not like reading a book. People don't stand up and read the same as they sit down and read. So you're limited in your word length. You've got to make sure that the words you use are punchy, capture people's attention. So all in all, all of this process can take, you know, getting your images scanned and prepared can all take about up to 18 months. Curator of Social History, Matthew Richardson. And you can find the latest temporary exhibition, which opened its doors today, over on the west of the island at the House of Mananan. It features a series of paintings by Eileen Shar. Her Painted Dreams exhibition is open to the public daily and will be on display until the 19th of November. But what about the House of Mananan itself? In contrast to the Manx Museum in Douglas, which houses a wealth of artefacts from all aspects of Manx social and natural history, the House of Manannan encompasses a series of interpretive displays depicting the island's Celtic, Viking and maritime history. Suzanne Walker is Heritage Site Manager for the attraction. It's a really important building within Manx National Heritage portfolio. It's a new build, well, relatively new build. We have a shop and a cafe and, and, and we get we get a mission fee as well from here and it helps us to make money to preserve Peel Castle and to look after the Peggy and and we need to do that too. We need to make money so we can look after the things that won't make us money. So we play a huge part in the visitor economy. We have sixty thousand people who come through our doors every year, which is which is massive and and we are open those seven days a week, so when a coach arrives on a wet Sunday, you know, it's important for us to open our doors and, and to give that really good Manx welcome and a really nice Manx cup of tea. Because why else do we tell the stories if it isn't to hand down the history of our time on this earth? We're in Manannan's welcome. You can probably hear him welcoming you to the House of Manannan and how you're going to be led around the centre by him and he's going to show you the history of the island through his storytelling. You've got 
an interesting model here. We start with the Celtic people in the House of Manannan and we have a model of a roundhouse which shows it in a few different stages, so sort of being built and, and with its turf roof. And it's sort of the precursor before you go into our two-thirds sized roundhouse where we tell you about sow and night and getting ready for the winter. Closer and closer they came. Now the spirits were at the doorpost, banging on it, louder than the drums that beat out the music of the moon. It really is like going into a different world. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? You have to bend to get through the trees and clamber over the rocks to, to get around the corner. It's a real sensory overload of sight, sounds and smells. There's an awful lot of Manx history to pack into one centre, so we, yeah, we do have a lot of audiovisual presentations, which was the style when it opened in 1990. Whereabouts are we now? We're in the Viking Longhouse now. The thing with the House of Manannan is the detail is fantastic. So when you actually start looking at things, you're looking at a lot of very, very well researched and archaeological finds on the Isle of Man. All the details are what we know or what we did know in 1997. Coming into the light, into the time where there's words written and not just runes and we actually do come into the light, there's lots of windows and we do have some objects in here which are a new addition to the House Manana. So this is probably what people would describe as more familiar as a, a traditional museum if you like. Yeah, we finally have words, we have banners with the stories on. We've also got a bit of a sort of that new feeling of museums where we're encouraging play as well so children can play while uh, the people who've brought them here can read and, and look at things and, and bring them over and encourage them to have a look as well but it's a very sort of relaxed space so on Kingdom of Man Gallery. And then through to Odin's Raven. Now this is the piece that probably most people associate with the House of Manana. Yes, definitely. So what is Odin's Raven? Odin's Raven is a Viking longship which sailed from Norway in 1979 with a crew of mixed Norwegian Manx sailors and they arrived on Peel Beach on Timor Day in 1979 to a, what I can imagine was an absolutely massive party. And there seems to be a scene going on. Yeah, when you come into this gallery you don't actually see Odin's Raven as Odin's Raven as the 1979 voyage but you see it as the Battle of Clontarf which was in 1014 where the Manx Vikings went over to Ireland to help in a huge battle there and they didn't fare very well. Um, you can probably see a bit of a poorly man at the end and, and a bit of a slave at the, <laughs> at, the, at the head of the ship. But the Manx Vikings got pretty much wiped out in that battle in 1014. But it's a really important part of our history as well and we've just used the boat to show that. Now where have we come to now? We're in the Chandler shop now on the first floor of the House of Manannan and it's full of things that you would have found in a Chandler shop at the um, start of the century. So lots and lots of things to see and touch. And interesting smells as well. Yeah, you can really smell the uh, carbolic soap, can't you, in here? Which is a trade secret to how we do that. <laughs> So this is really a more modern part of, of the island's maritime history with the, the steam packet vessels. Yep, we tell that really important story of, of our island's lifeline. We couldn't get a lot of our food or everything without the steam packet and it's, it's really important to tell, tell that story and we tell it at the end of the House of Manannan showing the progression through the boats all the way up to, to the Lady of Man and beyond with a sick pail here. One of the best objects. <laughs> I oh, bet that's a lot imagine. of use. I know, watching that out. And presumably it's a useful springboard for those with maybe a passing interest in Manx history to get a taste of something and then go out to one of the maybe more exposed sites to find out more detail. Absolutely, that's a really good point. And 
you come in here and you realise that we've got lots and lots of uh, sites in the landscape that you can go go to and explore and yeah we do sort of hopefully make you want to learn more and make you want to go out to Cashton Yard and up to Mulhill and see all those sites in the landscape and, and explore the Isle of Man for yourself and have your own stories to tell in the future about what you've seen and where you've been on the beautiful Isle of Man. Heritage Site Manager for the House of Manan, Suzanne Walker. As well as offering access to the island's history and heritage through its own sites, each October Manx National Heritage, in collaboration with other heritage groups around the island, offers opportunities to explore sites which aren't in public ownership or items which are not ordinarily on display. Community Outreach and Learning Support Officer Katie King explains more. We have 85 different partners that we work with over that. So that could be a private individual that owns a lovely house. It could be Peel Heritage Trust or the other heritage bodies. It could be the a military and aviation museum. So we all work together to put on something for free to encourage people to explore. And last year we had 3,000 participants coming along to that programme. So that gets people excited. It's this kind of frenzy of heritage over six days in October. And again, that has done quite a lot for attracting repeat visits for us so they might go on a walk with one of our curators and realize that you know I did not know that about the island I'm going to visit one of the sites now and discover a bit more so it's that's been a really great way of celebrating what the island has to offer because you know what it's like when you live here you don't really think about how lucky you are unless people are visiting you that's when we get the people you know they're so proud of their island when the visitors come but it's about celebrating that all year round I suppose we start planning it in January so my colleague Susie and I plan it with the partners and it is a long time in the planning and people say oh surely there's nothing left surely there's nothing left to see and we're like of course there is every year we we have multiple multiple new events that things that have uncovered stories that have been researched and people want to share this year we've got quite a lot of interest in the manx sultans on the isle of man so we've got an exhibition on that theme opening in october and we've got four different sultan based walks so this idea of walking through the ruinous farmlands and coming across these these beautiful old ru ruined cottages a lot of them are on private land so as part of Heritage Open Days, our partners organise with the landowners that we can bring people onto the sites, onto the land. It's been a really popular subject this year and um, I hope it remains, <laughs> it remains to be popular. Community Outreach and Learning Support Officer Katie King. And those Heritage Open Days start this Friday. You can find out more about this year's events by visiting the MNH website, maxnationalheritage.im. That's all for tonight's programme. Next week we'll be exploring more of the island's maritime history and archaeology and the art of balancing modern expectations with traditional techniques. Until then, have a very good evening. <laughs>